Hi there, and welcome to The Artist Craft. I'm your host, Stacy Cochran, and we have an outstanding guest with us in studio today. Kathy Pores is a senior editor at Algonquin Books. She earned her PhD in English from UNC Chapel Hill and taught at Elon for a number of years while gradually making the transition to working full-time at Algonquin. She is the series editor of Best News Stories or New Stories from the South, a yearly anthology of the best Southern short stories published in the U.S. This fall, Algonquin will be publishing UNC Chapel Hill men's basketball coach Roy Williams' memoir under her editorship. She is also the editor of the upcoming books The Girl Who Fell from the Sky by Heidi DeRoe, A Friend of the Family by Laura Grodstein, and uh, Our Noise, The Story of Merge Records. Uh, thank you very much for being on the show today, Kathy. My pleasure. Well, for folks who are unfamiliar with Algonquin Books, mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about the history mm -hmm. and the publishing vision. Mm -hmm. um, well, when Lewis Rubin was a professor at UNC, he felt that there ought to be a way for people to get published who didn't have New York connections. And so he started it literally in his backyard. Um, and he thought, why not? He had some great writers that he knew at um, UNC and at Hollins where he used to teach. And so he started this little place. We have the original sign in our building that says Algonquin Books, please close the gate because he had dogs. And um, <laughs> they started with a very small list. He hired one of his former students, Shannon Ravenel, and um, together they started to gather great writers around them. And this was in, in the early 80s. I had That's right. read an interview with Shannon mm -hmm. uh, recently where she described Algonquin as, as Lewis's brainchild, mm -hmm. and specifically uh, that he had gone to the MLA conferences after Christmas in 81 mm -hmm. and saw, like you were just saying, that writers uh, really that didn't have New York connections uh, were having difficulty mm -hmm. getting access to publishing, and that was really something that concerned him. Is that still uh, a, a central mission? It, it is a, a lot of houses, not all houses, but a lot of houses now no longer consider manuscripts if they don't come through an agent or is called solicited. Um, we still consider unsolicited manuscripts and not just consider, but we read them thoroughly and I'm proud to say we'll be publishing one this spring that came that way. So uh, yeah, you don't need entree through an agent. Well, a lot of our audience for these interviews uh, is con you know, consists of aspiring writers and, and folks who have published as well and are, mm -hmm. are interested in publishing. So a lot of the, the interview, I kind of want to steer towards that. But I do want to talk about uh, some of the books as well. Of course, you've got new stories from the South, uh, The Year's Best, which you are the, the series editor for this right. anthology. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about new stories from the South. It's um, what we do, Shannon started that way back as a way to find writers and then bring them gradually into the Algonquin fold, hopefully. So you, we go through um, all the, or as many journals as we can of um, journals and magazines that publish short stories. There are a lot of great ones all around the country. And we pick the best ones that we consider the best ones that are set in the South or written by a Southerner. And then from that pool, we'd come up with the final 20. It used to be that Shannon made the selections, and then after 20 years she decided it was time for a change, and she handed it over to me. And so to kind of give it a new uh, life, we, we now have a guest editor each year. So now, we've had Edward P. Jones, Easy Packer, and this year it's Madison Smart Bell. Now how do you bring on your, your guest editor? Is it just somebody that you've met, somebody that you know well from writers' conferences? Um, we try to pick someone we admire, whose stories we love, um, whose career we've followed for a long time. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a, a much discussion in the house, you know, can we get this person? And so we we're very excited to get Madison Smart Bell as very well cool. as the others. Now yeah. what are some of the, uh, what are some of the roles as a series editor? Do you, do, you do the initial, uh, you know, corralling of how many stories and how many stories yeah. do you read in a given year? Well, there are a lot that I start that I don't finish. Sure. <laughs> um, we're also lucky because they have to be set in the South, so that rules out anything that happens in New England, for example. Um, 
I end up usually sending the guest editor about 80 stories and from there they narrow it down to about 20. Um, I probably read more like 100 to 120 figuring out which are really worth sending. You don't want to have it be only your taste so you want to make sure you include everything that's good but also you include things that you wouldn't necessarily pick yourself. How do you do that? How do you pick something that you read and you say, okay, this isn't something that I particularly would pick? How do you step outside of yourself and are able to do that? It's tough. It's a lot of um, putting, you know, I'm making notes as I'm writing and sometimes my notes will say things like, ah, I don't love this story. But then I'll put it aside and I'll remember the images and I'll think about it and I'll think, well, maybe that's because I want a story to do this. Mm -hmm and other stories do that. It's, it's tough. I can't say that it's, it's easy and there are a lot of times that story I will go no, yes, no, yes, yes. And then it ends up in the collection so it was obviously the right choice. Very cool. Well, did you know <laughs> Shannon uh, before you started working at Algonquin? No, I only knew her name. I, I think many, many years ago I wrote a letter saying I'd love to work at Algonquin and like many of the uh, other hundreds of <laughs> letters sure. it was forgotten. But I did know um, Robert Rubin, who was Louis Rubin's son. We were in a creative writing uh, workshop together and um, when I saw he won a poetry contest years later I called to congratulate him and then started asking him about publishing. So he's the one who offered me an internship at Algonquin. That's Very how I started. Cool. When did you first know that, that you wanted to be an editor? Was there something that was a catalyst to saying, okay, this is a, a career direction I'd like to take? Well, I think uh, most editors will say that the way they read is, as they're reading, without even thinking about it, they're thinking, oh, this sentence could be better, or why didn't this happen? You know, it's like when you go to the movies and you're thinking, why it shouldn't have ended that mm -hmm. way. Um, so there's that internal critic going all, all the time, but I think I also knew it when I was teaching and um, sometimes for composition classes you have very strict assignments and I got a paper from a student who hadn't exactly followed the assignment, but I loved the paper. And as a teacher you have to give that paper a C or below, but what I wanted to give it was an A. Mm -hmm. And then I realized as I thought about it, what I loved about it was the voice the approach. She was taking a much more metaphorical approach to the assignment and then I started realizing what I want to do is help her write a better story mm -hmm. and and that was the impulse and then when I started interning at Algonquin suddenly you have that feeling in your life where things click and you say this is what I should be doing. It just felt right and yeah yeah. So but you were teaching do you ever mm -hmm. yearn to go back and, and teach do you ever do you know or shops or anything like that? Well, actually, uh, Chuck Adams, who is another editor at Algonquin, and I t did teach a course this past spring at UNC, a publishing class. So mm -hmm. I didn't miss it when I was in the classroom. I don't miss the grading. That's the tough part. <laughs> but I do miss the teaching. Yeah. But as an editor, you have to do kind of a similar thing. You have to say, okay, this manuscript is just not, not right, even though you know mm -hmm. the author has spent years in some cases working on that. Can you talk about that process? That's exactly right. I think teaching was very helpful in that regard because in teaching you learned a lot about how to critique something without hurting someone's feelings and so you want to make sure you say good things while you're also telling them what has to be fixed. Now tell us a little bit about your development with Shannon after you had started at Algonquin as an intern. At what point were you working with her? Well, she, uh, as soon as she managed to get me a paying job, which took about a year, um, we had a very small office. Um, they were on Weaver Street and we all had doubled up offices and I was lucky enough to be doubled up with Shannon and so I, she encouraged me to eavesdrop on her conversations, which was unavoidable. So I learned a lot about how she talked to authors, but then also she would show me her edited pages and just talk to me about the, her whole theory of editing and that theory really is that you want to try and get inside a writer's mind hmm. not edit from the outside in but from the inside out. What does that really mean? It means that you're not saying this sentence is how this sentence should read but this is how this character would say this sentence. 
if that makes sense. You're using your imagination a lot more is, is kind of what she's suggesting. Yeah. To, to really imagine the character and the consistency of the character. That's right, because even the books you looked at, all those narrators think and talk differently. And so if you come in to, like say an English teacher, you might correct it all to make it sound a certain way, but it should never, your voice personally as an editor should never be in there. How much of it is, I've never even thought of this before, but how much of editing is really activating your imagination and getting not only into the story, but like you're mm -hmm. saying, you know, imagining the character, what he or she has done in a previous chapter, mm -hmm. and then, you know, sensing intuitively, I guess, mm -hmm. whether, it, whether it's consistent and whether it moves the story forward. I would say a lot of it is, the word is closer would be in, intuiting, yeah, mm -hmm. because you are, trying very hard and I think that's why we have to read things so many times like every book we, edit, we read three or four times you're really trying to make sure that you're fully getting what that character would and would not do and and yes it does involve your imagination especially when it comes to suggesting changes to the plot because you think something's not working mm -hmm. well the guest is Kathy Pores. she is a senior editor at Algonquin Books uh, the new book, New Stories from the South, The Year's Best 2009, has just hit book stands everywhere. I've read it. There are some outstanding stories in here. I would encourage you to check it out. Uh, a couple of other things ab about Shannon, because I really want to kind of get mm -hmm. at the heart of what it is to, to be a really good editor. What are some of the qualities that, that she had that made her an outstanding editor? Um, she would say, I, I've read a lot of her interviews, and she would say that she's always been the kind of person that no matter what she's looking at, she's, she automatically starts thinking how it could be fixed, whether it's a person's outfit or their hair or <laughs> um, a pay, you know, page in a book. But also, um, I would say a good editor is, because it's not just the on-the-page editing, it, it's finding the work. Um, I heard someone once say that being an editor is a little like being a talent scout because you're looking for where the talent is and it's not, it doesn't always come to you perfectly polished. So it's seeing the diamond in the rough. Hmm. What are some ways that, that you, of course, there are literary agents who I'm sure, mm -hmm. you know, are, are pitching books to you all the time. What other ways are you looking for talent or maybe another way to, to ask the question, do you look for writers who could develop into being good writers, or mm -hmm. are you looking just at manuscripts? You're looking at a manuscript that comes across your desk in the mail or the email, and you say, okay, this is a book that I'd like to work with. Talk about that process of acquiring a new writer. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, there's the typical, you know, agent, things come in from agents, and if you trust the agent, they send you good things. But yeah, I think one of the great things about reading new stories from the South is mm -hmm. you'll read or four new stories from the South is I'll read a story and I'll say that person I bet could write a great novel. Mm -hmm. So that's one way of finding the talent. The other thing is, is um, occasionally at writers conferences or workshops if I go to Breadloaf or Swanee that kind of thing I'll see things but it's funny because uh, recently I have a friend someone I knew in graduate school many years ago and I always thought he had a great voice and I um, Every couple of years I would write him and say, when are you going to write that novel? And just this week, he sent me the first part of the novel. And there was, that was a hunch. You just kind of get a feeling this person knows how to... I think a lot of it is um, certain people have a real sense of rhythm mm -hmm. and a way of writing that tells you that they've got a lot more to say than what they're showing you. And then also the way their minds work, you know. Very cool. Yeah, it's, it's an absolutely fascinating discussion. Again, the, the guest is Kathy Pori. She's a senior editor at, at Algonquin. So how many editors at Algonquin uh, are there who have uh, acquiring power? A lot. <laughs> In the Chapel Hill office, we have Shannon, who, who is, um, she works from home a lot now, but she has her own imprint within Algonquin still called Shannon Ravenel Books. And then there's Chuck Adams, who joined us from Simon and Schuster a while ago, a and then in the New York office we have um, Amy Gash, who is an editor there, uh, Jane Rosenman, and 
Andre Miller, and then also we have an, a guy who works both for Workman and for Algonquin, Jay Schaefer. So one, two, three, four. It's about six seven, or seven. Seven editors, yeah. yeah. Now, I hope this doesn't come across as a strange question, but I'm curious too, I had been doing some research for this interview about Algonquin and I came across, uh, I guess it's Ina or Iris Ina Stern. Stern. Ina Stern. Uh -huh. What is the role of the associate publisher? How do you work with the associate publisher? Well, part of the challenge of Algonquin is that even though we started in North Carolina, we've been um, we've since uh, been taken on by Workman Publishing Company, which is in New York. And in New York, there is an Algonquin office with our publisher Elizabeth Charlotte. But there is the distance issue, and we do have conference calls a lot and visits back and forth. But we needed to have someone who kind of helps us have a liaison between both offices. So often Ina kind of almost acts like publisher in our house for the, I mean, Elizabeth is still the publisher, but Ina is the one, you know, making the decisions and conveying between Elizabeth and Ina things happen. Does that make sense? So you kind of have to convince them. When you've got a new manuscript, you send it to them and say, this is just blowing me away. Well, actually, we have a whole editorial board, which is all of the editors and Ina and Elizabeth, um, with the idea that um, you want everyone's input. Uh, um, it can be hard sometimes because we're not all going to agree. We're all different people. Mm -hmm. um, but that's also kind of a useful model for what's going to happen to a book when it leaves the house how different people are going to respond to it. So you don't have to get a unanimous agreement, but you do have to have enough people in there that you have a feeling this book is going to do okay. Now how often do you have these kinds of meetings where you sit down with Chuck, with, uh, uh, with Shannon, and I guess you have on speakerphone or maybe you Speakerphone, right. We have a conference call. It's once a week. So we've got all the editors in New York on the call and, and the editor in California, which is Jay Schaefer, and then us in a room. And, and they're long meetings, but very imagine. thorough. And everybody reads a good bit of the manuscript before they come to the meeting. So everybody's got some familiarity with, with what you're interested in. Exactly. And that can be tough because they can say, this isn't my kind of book, you know? But very cool. Well, you know, kind of taking up from what we're talking about here, working with your associate publisher, I read online where Ina mentioned that, this is a nice segue into uh, one of the books here that you're editing, a friend of the family mm -hmm. came to you uh, and that a number of houses were pursuing it. Uh, how did you actually acquire the book? How was that That's right. process? Lauren Grodstein's book, A Friend of the Family, which is coming out in October. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful book. She's just an amazing writer. You start reading it and you can't stop and that was my sense. There was a great agent whose, whose taste I trust a lot, Julie Bearer, and she sent it to me and she said, I think you're going to want to read this right away. So I did and of course I loved it and everyone else did too. There comes a point in that first draft where it it took something, I don't want to reveal anything, no spoilers, but something strange happened and it was a problem. And so I started writing to Julie and Lauren about possible solutions. I think I went through three or four. And then finally, we came to one, and they all said, yes, yeah, that's it. That's how we would solve it. So that was kind of the way that we won this book, because no, one, no other editor had yet come up with a solution to that problem. They just said, oh, there's a problem in the plot. And was that a, a moment when the, the writer said, okay, this is the house I want to go with, or was that something that the agent said, okay, this is the right house? Between the writer and the agent, they discussed it, and I think she finally felt like, okay, I do need to revise it, but this revision is the one that feels right to me. Very cool. So. Well, the book is A Friend of the Family. Uh, it's one of the books that uh, Kathy is editing, or has edited, uh, that will be coming out in October, Yes, as you said. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about working with agents since that was a subject kind of, of how this book was acquired. Uh, specifically, you know, there are a lot of them and I'm curious about the factors that you would look at if you were a writer knowing what you know mm -hmm. and had your pick of a few. Um, how you would choose an agent? Yes. Well, I think the most important thing is 
Does the agent feel passionate about your story? Does the agent feel like they love it so much that you know that they're going to be working for it tirelessly? Or do you have this feeling that they're just taking it on? Well, that seems like an obvious question, but I think sometimes people get so excited that they have agent interest that they jump at the first one who says they'll do it. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is, it's kind of tough. I mean, there are agents who are in bigger places and there are agents who are in smaller places and it's kind of a, if you send it to a bigger place, um, it, there is the chance it can get lost because they have a lot of other things they're doing. If you send it to a smaller house, a smaller agency, what's called a boutique agency, they're going to be concentrating on it more. Mm -hmm. um, some of the smaller agencies may not have that huge name and clout of the bigger agencies. It's sort of like publishing houses. But I would say the biggest thing is the passion and how much you feel simpatico with that agent because they really should be with you a long time. It's not a good idea to keep switching agents. Now what are some things that agents do that drive you crazy? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, I would say the hardest thing sometimes, and this is part of their job, is that they're the ones who have the access to the author. You don't usually get much access to the author while the deal is happening. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, as a small house, we want to be able to talk to the author and give them our personal approach, and, and the agent would prefer to handle this. So there are some agents that would just prefer that an author get more money and it's our feeling that the best agents understand that it's not about the money, it's about the handling and care of the book because the money will come eventually if it's handled right. Speaking of money, uh, this has <laughs> got to be a, a book that I know you guys are excited about. It's got to be a leader in-house. This fall, Algonquin Books is going to be publishing uh, UNC Chapel Hill men's basketball coach uh, Roy Williams' memoir. Uh, and we've got kind of an, an ARC here for that. Yeah, I, I wish I could have brought the cover because it's a very colorful color, cover of him squatting right near the courtside. Well, tell us a little bit about the process of, of working with, with Roy Williams on developing this book. He's not a writer. He's not he, a he's writer. He's a basketball coach. But as you may know, if you know Roy Williams at all, he's a great storyteller and he has a great way of talking. What he did was he found a sports writer, um, Tim Crothers. Mm -hmm. And Tim has been diligent about sitting with Roy and literally recording him and and then putting this all down into a book. So it it feels exactly like Roy talking. Um, I, I am so excited about this book, but I am a little biased. I did go to UNC, <laughs> but I also have oddly thought for many years, only oddly because then it ended up happening, but for years I've been thinking I wish Roy Williams would write a book. Just because he takes such an emotional approach to coaching. Mm -hmm. And because I've seen him turn teams around when they've had it so tough. And because he just has, there are things you want to know, like why doesn't he use timeouts the way other coaches mm -hmm. do? Um, what did he do to the 2004 team to make them suddenly come back after they've had such a rough time? before that. Um, what was it like when he left Kansas? And then he just had this whole life story that no one knew. I, he came from a very troubled background, so it's been really exciting for me. This actually. has got to be a book that I know you guys are excited about. So what's the title of the Roy Williams uh, memoir? It's called Hard Work, My Life On and Off the Court, and the reason it's called Hard Work is not only because that's what he came from. He really came from nothing and worked for every and got, but also that is the cheer that the team says right um, as they're coming out of a huddle, every single huddle. Mm -hmm. And like you said, now he had a very you know modest beginning from here in North Carolina, right? That's right, from Asheville. Carolina. Yeah, yeah. So to see that story is just got to be inspiring. I would imagine to to read it and to be working with it, and of course, I'm sure you're a big basketball fan. Yeah, it's just inspiring <laughs> to know. I mean, to th he. I mean, I don't want to give away much because there's so much in there to learn but for example that he um, loved basketball so much that he it was kind of where it, what he did to get away from his troubled family life that he would sneak into the uh, basketball gym and play in the dark at night 
um, with just the little exit lines for light, um, things like that. I, I just, uh, yeah, that's been exciting for me. And then also to just be finally on the inside of a game. The, all those games I've watched <laughs> where you, they were down to, you know, was tied or they were down by one and then they suddenly turned it around and you, you get to go right inside that game moment and mm -hmm. find out what he said to them and what they did and how they got out of those tight spots. Yeah, I can imagine you would, I, I do this a lot, I wonder what motivates people. Yeah. What is it that drives them to that level of success? And it, I mean, that's that image of him going into, these, into the gym to uh -huh. kind of get away from the chaos of, of sort of the, the life at home. Yeah, Kind of yeah. touches on that, I think. Right, I mean, and just that drive to win. And, and I think too, you know, there are so many great basketball teams across the country right now. There's, it's not, you know, like many, many years ago where it was a very uneven playing field. So, and they're all re recruiting hard. And, the, you know, Duke's getting great players. Kansas is getting great players. So what is it that makes one coach able to make one team make it work? When you're, if you're working with players that sure. are probably solidly the same, that's what's fascinating to me about it. I can imagine. Now tell us a little bit about what an ideal author would be like to work with. What's an ideal author for you? Um, two things. One is that they um, read my edits carefully and consider them and don't just decide I'm wrong. <laughs> That's pretty important. But the other component of that, which almost is the opposite of it, is that they think beyond of what the solutions I've thought of. I really only try to come up with solutions that I think are right, but the best writers will, will, go, will go one more and say that works, but this would work better, really. And we've only got about a minute left, and I okay. want to hit on both of these books, so maybe a, a quick answer to what the process was like working with Heidi, speaking of good authors to work yeah, with, yeah. on The Girl Who Fell From the Sky. Yeah, this is, um, that's the Bellwether Prize for Fiction winner. It'll be coming out in February. Um, she was wonderful to work with because I, that book is composed of many voices and so there was a lot of juggling around and adding sex, suggesting, you know, why don't you add in this or why don't you add in that and she was just incredibly agreeable. What a powerful novel too. I've read, I read the first part of the book so far and it's just, it's one of those stories, it's reminiscent of Toni Morrison. Yeah. It's just got so much emotion behind it. It's just amazing. It's an, it's an incredible thing to, to what it means to define yourself as black or white and how do you do that when the world wants you to pick. Well, I'd love to talk about our noise, but I just want to get a plug in for it because we are out of time for okay. today. I know this is your baby as well, Our Noise, the story of Merge Records, uh, but we are sadly out of time. I think we could probably <laughs> do a 60 minute interview here very easily for, for all of us here at, at the Artist Craft, M Marnie and, and Michael working very hard in the back and the folks over in Master Control. I want to thank you very much for Kathy uh, for joining us in studio. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And so we'll roll the credits here and I'll hold up the book and say go buy oh. this book. <laughs> it is a yeah, beautiful I'm sorry book. Sorry I ran out of time. Yeah it's um it's a fun book. It's uh